I had a great normal childhood in Milwaukee. Uh, big, cap happy Catholic family. Grew up. Uh, three, sis three sisters my father. My father was a World War II veteran. Pretty highly decorated. Fought with Patton's Third Army. Uh, didn't know anything about his service career because he wouldn't tell us. He just said, I did my job. And uh, uh, I graduated Mesmer High School in 1967 and went to work at Golden Guernsey Dairy and got a pretty good, well-paying job and thought, you know, I was not even 18 yet. I had a brand new MG <laughs> and a and gorgeous little uh, red-haired girlfriend. And uh, I just really had the world by the butt. And about a year in, um, in on August 18th, 1968, my brother-in-law was killed in Vietnam. Now, he never had any brothers, and I never had any brothers, so we kind of adopted each other as, as brothers. And um, it was, it, all of a sudden, Vietnam came and hit me right in the face, and I, I thought, you know, I have a father that's a, an American hero, a brother-in-law that's certainly an American hero, and I've really done nothing for this country. You know, at 18 years old, I've done nothing for this country. So about three days after his funeral, uh, when his body came home. My sister at the time was eight months pregnant with their first child. Um, I just thought, this is it, I'm, I'm joining. I never had any aspirations of going in, in the service at all, but I guess I always thought if I ever did go in, it would be the Marine Corps. So I went down and uh, enlisted in the Marines. In August of uh, 68, and I went into Marine Corps in November of 68. I was stationed with the uh, Headquarters Battalion, 1st Marine Division, Radio Platoon Communications Company. And what we did there was, we were, our, we were based in Da Nang, but uh, we would go out to different units that needed communications. So uh, for the first probably seven or eight months, I kind of bounced around a little bit. I was with uh, the 5th Marines in Anwa. I was with the 1st Marines in Fubai. Um, and uh, we just I just worked with infantry units and artillery units, we helped register some artillery and, uh, um, but I, you know, I, it, the time went fast for me and I did get to see different areas of Vietnam, but um, like with most guys, you know, I went over there gung-ho and I started losing a lot of that very, very quickly and got to a point where I just wanted to get, get the hell out of there, you know, get out and come back upright as we say it, you know, any day above ground is a good day, but um, yeah, I just, it was hard to, I was a 12-year Catholic grade school and high school kid, and I kind of bought into everything I, I grew up learning. And, and to see that, see some of the, the ridiculous things, um, it just made no sense to me. So, um, but I, I, I thought I did a good job uh, over there. Um, I, I, knew, I knew my, my job well. Um, I had, you know, great, great buddies. I mean, we, you know, literally, when you're, depending on each other to keep each other alive. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's nothing you can describe to anybody, it's just not, you know, so. I was a radar operator, so when we were out in the bush, we would call in artillery strikes. Uh, we'd find um, old French bunkers. There were some French bunkers around Anwa that needed to be destroyed. Uh, or we'd call in airstrikes. Um, if we were to be in contact, we would be calling in uh, medevacs to get the wounded guys out. Uh, but basically just a normal, you know, the thing, the thing they've been doing since day one, you know, fighting and winning and taking care of the wounded guys. And, but, uh, yeah, basically, you know, I was a communications for the, for the unit, and I used to get a kick out of the guys because they'd say when we were out in the, out in the bush, they'd say, um, you know, why don't you let me carry that radio for you or let me carry a couple of the batteries, and I would always joke around and say if we get, split up here, you've got 300 rounds of M16 ammunition on you, and I've got the whole 1st Marine Division sitting right here on my back, and that's where it's gonna stay. But, but you, get, you gain a, a, a camaraderie, um, a friendship, and a love for, for your fellow Marines that it's, you know, nothing ever comes close to that. And it, it's hard to describe to somebody that hasn't lived through it. Were you hit? I never was hit. Uh, <laughs> I'm not upset about that either. I was never hit, no. Close call? Um, no. Um, you know, I mean, I, we had guys obviously hit in, in operations I was involved in, but it's, you know, it, it's, I was never a fatalist, you know. If I would have been three seconds later, that might have been me, but it wasn't three seconds later. It was then. But, uh, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's it when you when a firefight starts, it's just total chaos. If it's just you know everything's flying everywhere, and we had a guy in one one uh, we got hit once that was just shooting straight up in the air and swearing at the top of his lungs and. And it was, I mean, there's some macabre humor over there, you know. It's like, Murph, Murph, no, they don't have air support. There's no, nobody's above us, you know. But, but um, yeah, there's just, it's just, a, it's so surreal that when it happens, I never, like when I hear, you just interviewed Ray, um, when he talks about Quezon, I never ha ever experienced anything like that, a barrage that just lasted for days and days and days. When we were out in the bush, our, our fire price were, were rel relatively just a few minutes and then we, we had all the air support and so you know I mean it was I used to feel bad sometimes for you know so we, somebody take a couple of pot shots from us at us from a, a tree line along a, a, a rice paddy dike and within 10 minutes we got two Cobras or a couple F4s running you know heavy heavy air support napalm maybe if it's and it's like just for a couple hey let's let's harass these Marines a little bit today, and then we, we you know, we destroy three quarters of their countryside, you know, but uh, a very beautiful place. Um, as we always say from the air, uh, I brought a photo album in with a, a lot of pictures from the choppers from when moving from one area to the other, and I always said it was beautiful until you got on the ground. That's when it, when it got pretty ugly, but it's very, you know, very fertile over there, obviously, beautiful, very, very humid all the time, um, but, uh, I, you know, proud to to do my duty. I I, I believe um, whether you're for the war or against the war, and I think that's something we finally learned now at this stage of the game that you know you can hate the war, but you don't hate the warrior. And I think that's the way it's gotten to be in this country, which is very cool. You know, we used to say like this interview. Um, Joe and Ray and I do a lot of things together, and I said I wouldn't have said, done anything like this even six or seven years ago. You know, but now people are. My kids, I have five sons, and uh, they got me a T-shirt a while back that said uh, I was a Vietnam vet even before it was cool. I feel good about my service. I always tell my kids, your grandfather was a, a hero, your uncle was certainly a hero, and your dad just helped blow a lot of shit up. Mm -hmm.